Economic Council of Governments. And I am uh, introducing the next panel, uh, Small Projects, Big Impacts. Um, the first panelist is Noelle Brooks. She's the program manager of the historic Willamette Main Street in Westland. Jamie Jonk is the economic development director for the city of Woodburn. And we have Jasmine Jordan, who's a resource assistance for rural environments, rare, I think you've heard of rare participants. She's working on the Main Street program for St. Helens. And who's starting? Okay. Let me just get myself queued up here. So hi everyone, my name is Noelle Brooks. I'm the program manager of Historic Willamette, which is in West Lynn. Uh, so I too, a little bit about myself, started growing up in the Midwest, very small farming communities. My houses were on dead-end roads and 30 years later, they are still on dead-end roads. Uh, from that I've moved to big cities and found myself again back in a small town community to enjoy. What we're gonna talk about today is um, the power of pop-ups. My first exposure to these was when a Columbia warehouse on the Washington side of the river had uh, gone up for lease for sale. It was a really large, basically like a boat that had been turned upside down. Uh, they needed to find someone to lease this building, to develop this building. And so a gallery group got together and found artists of varying degrees of um, fame <laughs> and then did the startup gallery. We're really good promoting it, went through their local media. And sure enough, um, you know, the event was a success. Three months later, they found a tenant. So since then, pop-ups have really evolved. Sometimes it's more to promote, like we were discussing earlier with an opportunity for small businesses to get their feet wet in a way that they can actually manage. Um, the other benefit, too, is, of course, for the landlords. Uh, they have these vacant properties that they need to get leased. So this is kind of like an open house every day for the up to expose people to the buildings that they may be able to have their own shops in. So um, no matter what size of town that you come from, we have all experienced uh, vacancies and the effect they can have on the surrounding area. Of course, um, there's always a little uptick in potential crime, whether it's vandalism or tagging. Um, also, too, it takes a hit to the surrounding businesses. It kind of gives that odd air. When you see failure in one space, or just vacancy, it's associated with failure and then what's wrong. Uh, also, potential uh, cost for local government for its upkeep and safety, you know, dealing with the vandalism issues like that. We also know that when we travel to these areas, flat foot traffic is flat revenues. If I have to get back into my car to drive down two blocks in the driving rain to go to the next shop, I might just keep driving. My, my grocery list might be calling me and I've stopped. I'm not gonna stop for lunch. I'm not gonna go to that other boutique. Oh, get my organization here. So the great thing about um, they, it encourages creativity. Companies get set in their ways and pop-ups prove to be a low-cost, high-return way to shake things up a bit, be it a day event or a holiday season. Uh, we discussed this a little bit too about these really big box stores that kind of get set in their ways or they're realizing that people really are liking the boutique feel, the niche feel. Uh, this gives them the opportunity to do that. Say that it's, for example, we're talking about rural communities, your local coastal farm supply store. Well, there might be a really strong equestrian group in the area. Maybe something they could do is a pop-up shop that really does just focus on the season for rodeos. Saddles, bridles, um, show off their wares. It also helps you reach new audiences, in addition to test markets. So a big shop might be thinking, I want to branch out into this community, but I'm not so sure will they support a garden center. A pop-up would allow them to do that. With a short-term lease, they could see you know, what the community's response is, and then two, that surrounding community benefits, because that's an established business that now is going to share with all of their clients, hey, guess what? We've got a small shop here. You should come and visit. It also helps re-energize your community. It not only puts money in the landlord's hands, but it brings new shoppers to a location they may not have traveled to otherwise, bolstering and exposing neighborhood businesses to a new audience. So say that, for example, um, oh, there's so many examples. I follow my favorite winery, but they really don't have a tasting room that's open year-round, but I do get their regular mailers, and believe me, I read them, especially if there's a discount for a case. So they have decided to do a pop-up in this location. I am there. I pick up my friends, 
hit the road, go to a town I've never heard of before, and lo and behold, little did I know that past the gas station and the drive through restaurant, there's this charming little community that sits there I would have never otherwise known about had I not been invited by another business who chose to do a pop-up. Then after I'm done having my wine, I need something to eat, and oh my goodness, look, there's a gift shop. So suddenly my experience from the singular pop-up shop in a location I've never been to before is now a go-to for me. And I'm gonna make a point of traveling to this location four times a year because it's sweet, it's cute, and who knew that I have the inside knowledge on these places. Pop-ups give me the opportunity for the upper hand. So then the first thing to do in setting up your own pop-up Am I on the same page? Oh, yeah. Is to contact the property owners. Um, call the number for lease for rent in the window. See if they're working with a commercial uh, real estate leasing individual. Make that connection. See how amiable they are. And this isn't just for your vacant storefronts. We'd also mention vacant lots that need to be uh, developed. Contact them as well. There's opportunities there for infill. It really is the appeal to them, um, you know, is to start that conversation. If you have a website for your community, or for example, I have a nonprofit group that I represent, you make a space on that website to show all of the current leases of the people who might be thinking to locate to that location. Um, help them help you. You're giving them a value. You're exposing their leased property that they're sitting on and paying to insure with the mortgage and the taxes uh, as an open house. So there's also important documents to think about when you're looking at these places. Even if they sit on your board, it's important to have a lease in hand that you've signed for the agreement of the term. Also make sure that you've got documents like your insurances in place, uh, vendor applications, additional licenses and, licenses and permits. You want a winery to come? Do you need to have a special permit from the OLCC? Also two different cities have different uh, permits for temporary business. Make sure that you've reached out to them, that everyone's involved in the conversation. And then basically you are hosting a party. So think of it that way. You are the host. You're making sure that all of your vendors are happy, that you um, have an opportunity to pass out that information if you'd like to lease this space. You're doing the service to the person who's given you the area to do it within. Um, also to um, the people that are coming in. They may be locals, they may be outside. Promote your other businesses. Did you know, if, oh, you know, you've come here from out of town, this is the nearby lodging. Have you plans for dinner? These are our restaurants. You know, really use it as the catalyst that it can be. And if you are a nonprofit, then have it be a way that the community can actually um, realize the benefit that you give to the, the area. You know, you've created a, a business opportunity for locals to come shop and dine at. You brought tourism into the area. They might want to be a part of that action. Make sure that you have the opportunity to capture their information, to contact them about future events that you might be holding, as well as do they want to be involved. Um, make sure to have that presence there. So you also want to plan that event wisely. We're talking about rural communities today. You may not have the volunteer power or the budget to pull this off yourself. Maybe your role is to just be that mentoring advocate. You're putting that landlord in contact with that business that wants to do that small pop-up. Possibly you're blessed with a, a bunch of volunteers and you actually have some money from sponsors that you want to try this on your own. Go ahead, what I do is I shop my local farmer's markets. I shop my local holiday events. I vet that way. If I see somebody who has their, their act together, they look like they want to continue to do this, they might be a potential new business to take the lease on, I make sure to get their card, contact them, leave them with my card, and that's what gets that ball rolling. Um, also, too, for budgeting for your advertising. You have so many opportunities for free advertising we didn't have just 10 years ago. Use your social media. Every time that you do a shout out on, say, a Facebook page, and you link it to that person's business, you're not just then promoting it to your own audience, but to their audience as well. So then if we take example of a pop-up market that is um, multi-business, every single business usually has a Facebook page. Every Facebook page has their own group of followers. And say that you do a percentage to a nonprofit. I've decided to donate 10% of proceeds to Habitat for Humanity. My goodness, do they have a following. Now I've just expanded the net that much further. Also, too, make sure to get in contact with your local newspapers. Calendars are often free. Um, it might be a really good, if you're in a small community, it's a to-do. It's an event. Take advantage. Have a press release. Have them come out and take photos. 
So for the day of, again, it's the hosting of that party. Make sure that you have volunteers in place if you are doing this yourself, that you're able to circulate throughout the crowd. You know, make them know what you're about, what you're trying to accomplish. Also, too, it's an opportunity to get feedback from the folks that might be from out of town and had always thought to come, like we are talking about earlier, leave the city have a relaxing life out in a rural countryside, start that shop up that you had been dreaming about all those years, help to make it happen. So then I want to talk a little bit about then what my group specifically did. We had, um, so in the community of historic Willamette, it is off the 10th Street Avenue. You have to get past the gas station and the services for travelers to get to our location. It is charming. We have historic shops, with great restaurants, um, charming old homes, a, a walking tour brochure. It's really a great space. But when I started, we had about a handful of retail locations. Since then, because of retirement, increased rents, um, we've lost almost all of them. So we had a double storefront that's kind of in decline at this point. It's changed ownership. And to save their lives, they just couldn't find anyone who wanted to step up and take that lease. At the same time, our city actually hosts their holiday events right down that main block. So I have the audience of a parade. Our nonprofit group actually does a free carriage ride. And here was an awesome opportunity to put pop-up to the test. So we contacted, like I had mentioned, our farmer's market vendors, along with some others that we had found throughout the area, folks that were nearby that had shops that maybe had extra merchandise. And we, and it, is, it was a pull off. We pulled off an amazing pop-up that took the entire audience that would have otherwise left after the parade and race, and they stayed, and they shopped, and then they visited the restaurants, and then they stayed a little bit longer, and they overwhelmed our carriage ride line, and it was fantastic. So then every single person that visited and had that experience now has a positive experience about that area. And believe it or not, in the two days that we had that market open, uh, a couple of the gals, just to give you an idea on sales, she did 10 times that day, which she did at the average farmer's market. That's amazing. And that's a lo local gal that makes things herself, that has a regular nine to four job, and she actually took the leap to do it full time. In addition, someone came through, and they were from uh, way up north past Seattle on one of the islands. They actually have a really successful vintage business, and they had thought to relocate to the Portland area, and lo and behold, here's this great place up for lease. It was a no-brainer, and so currently, I kid you not, the last two weekends, she's hosted her own pop-up to test that market, and this next weekend is her next market and final where she gets to make her choice. So as people see the bustle and the hustle, then guess what? One of our wineries realizes they might need a, a tasting room presence on the main drag. Maybe they're interested. That next person is in line now, too. And the real great thing is that for the person who owns that property, and they see the value that we've given them in getting them in contact with these people, now they have money in their pocket, there's interest in their business again, they're realizing that the investment on the facade of their building and the impact that it has for our Main Street might be something that they want to invest in. And so those conversations have happened as well. So overall, for us, the pop-up has been incredibly successful on every single level. It was on a very uh, short time span with an amazing uh, small group of people that, that made it happen. So. Um, with that, uh, just to give you some ideas as to what Portland's doing, I know it's a much bigger city, but just to show you that if you continue to do this and have it be part of your practice with every vacancy that comes up, or maybe even, heaven forbid, we don't have any vacancies, we use the church basement, <laughs> just to keep that momentum. Uh, six years ago, Portland was in its recession. Tons of vacancies everywhere. A group of two gentlemen would start four pop-ups throughout town the last six years. This last year, they increased their sales to those vendors 73%. They uh, grossed $100,000 in sales. And even though the uh, vacancy rate now in Portland is half of what it was then, it was at 12%, now it's at 6 they uh, actually are continuing the program because of the success. They don't want to drop the ball. They want to make sure that they are at zero vacancy. So all in all, I think pop-ups have been a great success. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. I guess we have a Q&A offer to this? Yeah. We are. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to hand it on over. Well, good morning. I'm Jamie Jonk, and, <laughs> and I'm the Economic Development Director for the City of Woodburn. And uh, previously, a lot of you know me, formerly known as uh, Jamie Jonk, Economic Development Coordinator, Coordinator for Clackamas County. I've 
waving at my friends over there. Um, so I've had a lot of experience working with rural communities throughout this region and staying with the uh, rural development and rural community. I, I too am from the Midwest, so getting to work back in a rural community in Marion County is a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, so Starting at the city of Woodbury just over a year ago now, um, the first thing I thought was important to do was get to know our businesses and our community and our downtown. So I walked around, talked with our businesses, did that outreach that is so critical early on for when you're establishing yourself in, the, in a downtown or Main Street district, and uh, got to hear from them the things that didn't work, I'm sure you guys have never heard this, what didn't work the last 50 years in their community, um, and then shared what we can work on going into the future. So I kept hearing over and over again, Woodburn needs a downtown restroom, Woodburn needs a downtown restroom, which we're handling that. So I thought, okay, check mark early on, first month in the job, we got a restroom being built. So I was really pleased with myself over that. Um, but then I kept hearing about alleyways. Woodburn has an alleyway system that goes right through its downtown, right off the main street. And I kept hearing all of these scary stories about downtown's alleyway systems. But you know, being a main streeter at heart, I knew that I would be undeterred. I, we can make a beautiful downtown alleyway alleyway system, we can create a safe, clean alleyway where pedestrians can walk and feel all that good, you know, warm feelings about it being in there. You know, it's visionary. We can do this. And then we preserve, while preserving the vehicular and the service access, because our alleyways also serve our businesses in the downtown core. That what I kept hearing over and over, over was that the, they're dark and unsafe. We can put in some lighting. We can create a more visual, um, visual uh, presence in the downtown. We can curtail some of those unsavory behaviors with some security lighting. Uh, we can create a more positive and inviting downtown by addressing some of the images and really improve for our businesses and our, our core community um, the values that we really want to instill in our downtown. And I literally was walking, said, I'm going to go check out these scary dark alleyways. So I felt that we can do this. We can achieve our goals. Then I saw the alleys. Yeah, yeah, not so much to look at when you walk down in our alleys. So, but being undeterred as we are, I said, okay, who can we partner with, we the city, who can we partner with besides the business community, because this is a big job, to really address some of the concerns we have. And the little blue containers are owned by a wonderful company called Republic Services. That is our, um, our uh, disposal company in the vicinity. So I reached out to them and I said, hey, could you guys work with us on a, on a project downtown? So being undeterred as it were, I um, met, partnered with a gentleman named Matt. Matt came out and I showed him the alleys. I said, what do you think? Well, the first thing they did is they went and cleaned up those alleys because it was a little scary to, to even look at it. Um, but we needed to be able to create a, a plan for them that where it would not interrupt their service in their downtown. So he said, hey, you know what? We can really do something here. We can enclose these trash receptacles. We can put them all on the same side and create something more visually appealing. We talked with PGE and PGE said, yeah, we can do some security lighting down here to make things work a little more effectively for your downtown. We have had a problem with some criminal behavior, some tagging, and we can really help to do this. Um, we really needed to paint the buildings. Right now it's a patchwork quilt of covering up the vandalism um, on the buildings and the tagging. So we talked with Metro. What a great partner. Metro said, we've got all the free paint you could need. Yeah, all we need to know is what you need what colors you need. So we got to a good partner with Metro. And then we have through our Urban Renewal uh, Building Improvements Revolving Loan Fund a design services component to it. So to help uh, businesses visualize how their improvements and facade renderings can help their uh, businesses. So we reached out to DECA Architects, um, who serves in the capacity as our um, um, design services provider. And we said, okay, David, first we toured the alleyways. He was really impressed. We said, what can you do to help us with these alleyways? How can we visualize something that we can afford, A, as a community, that we can engage our business and property owners, and that we can still utilize for the service trucks, the delivery trucks, and the vehicular traffic? So David came up with some really interesting concepts that were really not too unattainable. We figured that we could um, paint the existing facades. A coat of paint works wonders in your downtown. All of you know that. 
simple coat of paint, maybe accentuating the doors with a pop of color just to kind of give it a more unified look because a lot of the businesses do use these as service stores, but we wanted to be able to complement this. It's a very visual downtown. For those who know uh, downtown Woodburn, we have our beautiful plaza way right across the street from this alleyway. So you go from lovely plaza, really beautiful, a fountain to the alleyway we just saw. So we wanted to create a place where it was a little more inviting. We thought that paint is not the only thing we need to do. We need to get in that security lighting. We really need to address the dark, scary alleys in the evening hours. And then we also wanted to make it more, uh, warm it up a little bit with some greenery, some plants. We'll put in some nice plantings along there with the, with the businesses and property owners to manage those plantings. But we also wanted to make it just a little step above, adding those um, decorative banners to really kind of add kind of welcome to downtown, here's a business ice cream, museum, we've got a lot of businesses along that block. And then of course we've got our painted metal enclosures and those are really gonna be serviceable, again designed by the um, disposal company so we know it's going to work for them. We're not creating something that's going to be cumbersome or unusable by either the businesses or the service providers because it's all accessible and designed by them. And then um, staining the existing pathways. We're looking at how we can do brick inlays. Forget about it. It's way too expensive. And we decided, well, you know, a lot of communities are going with this brick staining. It's a lot less expensive. It's much easier to maintain in the long run. So just some staining can really enhance the overall quality and vision for um, this area. And then we wanted to make a nice gateway into the uh, downtown. We had done a project on North Front Street, which added all of those nice elements with the um, bike racks and the trash receptacles and the benches and the beautiful street lighting. And we're going to be replicating that on First Street in this next fiscal year. So we wanted to be able to bring that, that bridge together between Front Street and First Street, which flanks either side of the alleys, and then put the same style of lighting there to invite people into this beautiful pedestrian area. And uh, we also wanted to, um, you know, kind of, in the long term is, is to encourage the business and property owners to do more outdoor seating and really to engage them a little bit more. So the total project cost on this was way over the moon. And then we said, okay, let's scale it back to really what we can do and what I can reason reasonably present to our urban renewal agency and city council as a real project that can reach our goals, create that safe, friendly pedestrian area, and to um, afford it which is always the big thing when you're working with a small rural community. So the Urban Renewal Agency said, yes, we'll dedicate the $71,000 to the project. But we didn't stop there. Partnering with Republic Services, they're going to install all the trash receptacles, not only on one alleyway, but on three alleyways, because it is a five alleyway system. And three of them are currently ones that we've targeted for the first couple of phases for the project, this being the first one, just to template it and see how it works and how well it's received. Um, so we partnered partnered with uh, Republic Services on that, and we applied for and received a Marion County Community Projects grant, so thank you Marion County and the EDAB for approving our project, because we really didn't want to just stop at one alleyway, though we had the funding for it, we wanted to carry that on to put the security lighting and do the enhancements we could with the additional funding. So now, with the project partners, we're able to kind of extend those funds a little bit further and achieve a little bit more. And then, of course, we went, look, we live in the middle of nursery, we excuse me, Woodburn is in the middle of nursery country out there. So going to our nurseries, going to our farmers, and going to other partners in the area, we're able to get the, the soil and the plantings donated for the planters and getting all of those elements that we wanted to achieve there. So again, we, we got the commitment from Urban Renewal and our city council. So we are really leading the charge on the effort. Again, partnering with public services, great partners. Always look for those partners in your community you may not think about because who knew that you could partner with your disposal company and they would provide such a huge, tremendous uh, uh, contribution to our downtown. Then looking at um, PGE, we're work working with our lighting specialist and then the local electrician who can give us some discounted values on the lighting that we'll, we'll work on. And then um, look, working with Metro Paint, again, for the communities out there, Metro has paint through the Metro Paint program. Take advantage of it. Neutral base with a little color goes a long way. Great partner in the project. And now, of course, with Marion County's um, community project funds, we're able to achieve more for the funding that we currently had. So this is a great project. We're under um, engineering and design currently. We'll be going into the actual construction if it would ever quit snowing long 
enough for us to get out there. I mean, really, March. Uh, so that was a little that was a little bit of a downer. But as soon as our weather will cooperate with us, so it could be next year. We never know for sure. But we're hoping that we can top this out this fiscal year. And then when I come back to our Main Street conferences in the fall, I'll be able to show you the actual results of this fantastic project and how we're carrying it forward to other projects. But it's really a small project in our community that's going to have a tremendous impact broadly throughout our community. So. Um, we're not taking questions now, so I can't answer that anything for you. Um, but I did put the slide in just in case. So if anyone would like information, uh, I know that we're providing these. I'm looking for Sarah. We're providing these PowerPoints online at some point. And um, we'll, if my contact information will be in there, I'd love to share this. Because again, it was looking for partners outside the box on this and looking for funding resources from within your community, like with Marion County. It's really a, a huge um, opportunity for our our community to make a big difference in our downtown. But, so thank you very much. Hi, so my name is Jasmine Jordan. I am the Main Street Coordinator for SHEDCO, which is the St. Helens Economic Development Corporation. It's a downtown association in St. Helens, which if you guys don't know, is located about 30 miles north of the Columbia River from Portland. So located pretty close to Portland, but still far enough away to be considered rural as a population of about 12 to 13,000. And with many communities that are in that kind of range, we have issues with people tend to work in Portland, but kind of live in St. Helens, so they kind of care about the community, but not really. And maybe if they grew up there, they did, but in a lot of times the people who grew up there, they you know, they, they miss the mills and the fact that it's gone down in a lot of ways because the timber companies moved out, the paper mills closed down. A lot of them pretty recently, in 2012, Bozy, which is one of the largest paper producers in that area, moved most of their plants out. They still have a small um, Cascade, which is a tissue brand there. So a lot of you guys' communities probably have similar issues in those kind of ranges. And with our downtown, we have an either an more unique situation in that the downtown really has two different areas. So the older area of St. Helens kind of developed along the river when the barges were moving. So they have a lot of buildings built in the 19th century in that area. Those are, that's the, the historic district. The other area, which is called the Houghton District, is about a mile closer to Highway 30, so away from the river, and that was kind of built along the railroad. So there's a railroad that runs there. And so those two communities, about a century ago, kind of were separate, and over time they've kind of grown together. And the reason why that's unique is because now our downtown district is kind of split in a lot of ways. And so there's about, I don't know, maybe about a mile area where it's kind of residential. So first you're in the downtown district, and then if you are a shopper or you're not new to the area, you might come to the end of 11th Street and think, oh, there's nothing else here. I guess I'll just go back to Portland. Not realizing that, oh, if you only drive half a mile farther or walk half a mile farther, you realize that we have this beautiful riverfront. The riverfront is gorgeous. Probably one of the best places in Oregon, not to, you know, I know some of you guys have great places, but it's, it's a fantastic spot. Kind of unknown to a lot of people. A lot of people have no idea that you can get to the river from St. Helens. And so we've been doing a lot to try to build up that area. And actually, a lot of that area, the reason why it hasn't been capitalized on is because it was owned by the paper plants. Right? And so when those companies moved out, blessing in disguise, the city was able to buy that barrier back. The great thing about buying this area back now is that now we can use it to develop. You know, so there, there's been a lot of, uh, there's a huge, huge process going on right now. I encourage you guys to go look it up. We're um, using the herbal renewal, new herbal renewal development coming through, I think it was just past re um, this past cycle. So, you know, those processes tend to last between 15 to 30 years. So it's, you know, long-term planning, but we're in the process of planning that now. And so, you know, this was going on since about 2012. Shedco, which is the downtown association, realized that there needs to be a lot done in the current districts we have now to, to help support this future development. And like the previous speaker said, in a lot of communities that have kind of faced this 
lack of uh, industries in, in the hit past have a lot of vacancies in their Main Street areas. And, all, and people just don't shop in the communities. Maybe they go to Portland or, you know, there's all kinds of reasons. Who knows why? A lot of times the buildings are in disrepair. A lot of the buildings are really, really large spaces, and so it's difficult for you know, one person to come in and fill that entire space, rent out that entire area. You know, rents are fluctuating kind of high. So, you know, pop-up shops are also a great way of helping this. Uh, one idea that Shetco had was to try to find a way to fill the vacancies in a little bit more of a temporary place for business owners who were maybe in that intermediate stage. So maybe they've, they've done a few different pop-up shops before, they, they have a kind of a com customer base, but maybe they just don't have the additional support needed to maybe take that extra step. And so a little bit of my, my background when I was in, in school, we, I've studied economics, and a lot of times, uh, rural economic, especially when it comes to international communities, and a lot of different international communities take a, have, they have a lot of different, their, their laws are a little different when it comes to you know, who can provide loans and stuff like that, and so they have a lot of really flexibility when it comes to providing like micro loans, or you know, they'll give someone a cow and they'll say, you know, we want a certain money, money back after this period of time. So then since they loan out the cow, and then the person, you know, makes money by making cheese or whatever, then they give the money back, but get to keep the cow, a different process like that. And so there's ways that we can do that here. And maybe some of the regulations are a little higher, but that's why organizations like Shedco can come in and kind of help with some of those barriers. And so, you know, Shedco, like a lot of you guys, downtown associations are supposed to be liaisons. So between the city and the community, or between even other institutions, financial institutions, private institutions, and the community, getting those business owners resources. And so I'm gonna talk to you about this business plan competition that Shedco did a couple years ago, and the reason why it's you know so great now is because I'll talk about a little end, how once you guys, if you are able to set up this kind of process, it can be a cycle, something that can run on a cycle. And so, if Oh, I have this light. Okay, so I just want you guys to read that. So the best part about the business plan competition is that it takes one process and it combines a whole bunch of different things together and it gets a lot of different goals done at one time. So if you guys are familiar with the Main Street process and all, there's four different committees usually, design, promotion, organization, and business development or something like that. At least with Shedco and with some organization, I see that a lot of volunteers are really excited about the promotions and the design committees. So they like to get involved with the, the projects that are you know, highly artistic, are really highly you know, motivational in different ways. And some of the more boring tasks, like organization or business development or writing business plans, they kind of fall off the wayside. It's a little bit harder to find activities that get those types of things done, which are, tend to be very important. Organization is very important when you have a business, as a lot of you guys know. So this process put a lot of those together at one time. So let me just give you the brief goals of the process. So the business plan competition sent out an application to all, you know, anyone in the community who is interested. And their goal is to put together a business plan and to turn it into Shedco. So the business plan had to have you know, a lot of different requirements from you know, executive statement to a mission statement to budget to all these different, you know, everything that you need for a business. And they submit it to Shedco. When they submit that application to Shedco, they review it and the winner, first place, gets a reward. So there's a couple caveats, obviously. The first thing is that in order to turn in the application, there's a series about a month or two long, a month, two, three months, however long you guys want, where the people who are participating 
are involved in these workshops. And workshops are sponsored, we got our sponsored by the OSU um, Extension Outreach Program. So the OSU has set up, you know, different meetings. So, you know, once a week, Thursday night, say Thursday, Friday nights for people who couldn't come, you would go to the workshops and learn how to write a business plan or learn how to do these different goals. And so, you know, different speakers would come in and give the people, the, the potential business, um, the applicants, advice of not only from all ranges, not only from how to start a business, if some of them are, you know, really new and really don't know where they're, you know, have no idea where to jump in at, all the way to people who are a little more already settled or maybe they have a customer base and maybe they need to learn about, uh, more about hiring staff personnel or how to do pro taxes properly. I mean, a huge range. And the thing is, if you set something to your community, you can kind of do a survey and de decide which things are lacking and which you know, businesses need to be improved on. And so, you know, throughout those workshops, the, the best thing about it is that the businesses, even if their application wasn't chosen at the end, they were able to get these free resources on, you know, how to improve their business. Um, the other partnerships we had, of course, are partnerships that we need to secure the funding for the prizes. So the prizes were, in, in a sense, we needed to raise tw only, only, I say, $25,000. So $25,000 is what Shedco was attempting to raise for the prizes. $5,000 would go to the first prize winner free of charge, and the other $20,000 is a loan, a, a very, very low interest rate loan that we give to the business. So the business has a year to start up their um, location after this point in time, after they won, and then they, you know, they pay back the very low interest rate loan, and they also get the $5,000 grant. And so, you know, these partnerships are, so we partner sh with um, Wana Credit Union, with Fiber Credit Union, with St. Helens Community um, Credit Union. So these are all local institutions. You know, local institutions tend to um, fund these projects a lot more than you know, Chase Bank or U.S. Bank. So, you know, it's really good to partner with those types of um, organizations. And the best thing about it is that that 20000 was actually put into a CD for Shedco. So really what happens is that the, if you guys wanna know a little more about the details, I know we're running a little low on time, I'll give them to you guys later, but in the end what happens is that Shedco still has that money. So, and the, the business owner has that loan as well. And so in the end, as the business owner pays back the loan, the interest from that loan is therefore, is now given to Shedco. And so at the end of the three year CD, um, Shedco now has $20,000 that they can do this process with again. So that's a good part for Shedco with the business owners in the downtown district. We, as Shedco also provided resources on one of our, um, our board members is an architect and so he provided some, um, some pro bono resources to help the person actually get into the location. Um, you know, of all the vacant properties, we, we did all the work with, you know, finding the ones that would fit best with the permits and all of that. And so the location, if, go back to the first page, so that is the location of the winner. Um, the organization is called Tea Time. So that was our first place winner and is a woman who wanted to set up a nice spot that people to come and have tea that's pretty affordable. Um, if you guys would go to, and I wanted to put a picture on the inside, but I wanted it to be a little more um, interested. I wanted you guys to go check her out, her Facebook page, because she is just, you know, fantastic, very, you know, decent for her places, the, her, and, you know, it's fantastic little area. Each little room is set up with different um, little cute designs, and you can have a party, you can set up, you know, the way, the way, we want, the way you want it. And so, um, you know, it's a really great business, really great business plans. You see it's a fantastic building. Um, it was a vacant, and it's right on our main street. It's in one of the areas that kind of is right in between those two districts that I talked about earlier, so it kind of helps with connectivity in a lot of ways. Um, and she's doing really well, and she's been doing better. She recently was, first was only open for like two or three nights, like over the, you know, the weekends, but now she's open all seven days. And that was our first price. So she was the one who got the loan. However, because of all of the, you know, the workshops and stuff before, another one of our contestants was able to open as well. Um, that was a location called The Vault, which they do uh, gymnastics for kids, which again, is doing very well. And um, a lot of them, you know, have said that the, the support was the most important part. So, you know, knowing that they, if they had a business question, 
or if they had an issue with the city or if they had the you know these boring organizational tasks that are really very important to running a business they know that they can go to, to Shedco the downtown association for answers they know that you know they have these partnerships that they can use and so the last thing I want to talk about really briefly is just possible improvements for the future. So, you know, with the best thing about this, again, is that it's, it's a cycle. And since we got these, you know, with the CD funding, we could do this process again. And so, you know, we talk about different improvements that we can maybe do for the future for this program. And, um, you know, one of the best thing, one of the things that people who were involved in this process came back and said is that they, you know, they wish that they had a little bit in the beginning, maybe more um, marketing in the sense of uh, getting this out to a different array of individuals. And kind of what we thought that meant is that maybe in the future we can have different levels. So we can have the level where, you know, a person who is ready to move into their own location, but also maybe having a level for, you know, pop-up shop saying, hey, if you want to open a pop-up shop, we'll give you just, you know, a grand or $500. And I thought also, you know, possibly we could do this with um, even lower level or like high school students and instead of offering a, um, a loan for a business, but saying, you know, get offering them scholarships to come up with business solutions to different issues that people have. And so you can use this kind of idea where you take business and make it a little more exciting where, you know, you have these workshops in the beginning and then you, you know, use a, um, your relationship with different financial institutions to um, fight funding for smaller events in your community. Great. So the question was, what are the business owners um, do, committing to the project for the Woodburn uh, alleyways, um, since the city is kind of leading the charge on this? We've reached out to our, our business and property owners uh, along the alleyway and have asked for their commitment first, since we are proposing to paint and make alterations to their private property, we have to get them on board, right? And we're also offering to paint their properties and, and make all of these great enhancements to make their lives a little easier, because they're the ones who ultimately said, this is a concern for us. Um, so they are on board with the program. Um, if we are in need of any of their commitments, they're right there. At this point, we're not asking them to um, pay for the painting. We're, we're, we as the city are wanting to really take this um, charge on this project, but we are asking them for their commitment on the long-term maintenance. Make sure that when you're doing your, uh, your recycling or you're putting your, your trash in your receptacles, Lock the gate afterwards, because they will be locked gate. Clean up around your space. Help us to maintain the overall um, appearance of our alleyways. Since this was a concern of theirs, we're uh, trusting them to participate and have input in the process as well. Uh, this question is for Jasmine. I was wondering if you could tell us our, our, a little more about that revolving, revolving loan fund. You withheld some of the details, but I'm really interested in that. Um, how you capitalize that 20,000. I thought you said it was from the interest, but um, maybe I was unclear there and how, what the structure is for maintaining that over time. Yeah, so, yeah, so the funding, um, it was I said, provided by like Wana Credit Union, and so, so it was three different credit unions, and they each provided, I think, was like 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, so it was 15, and I think there was like a 5,000 on top of that from a fourth one that wasn't, um, yes. Uh, my name is Bob Burns. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I wasn't finished with this question. Just a quick answer. Oh, okay, sorry. I just thought you raised your hand. Yeah, so, um, and the way the funding works is that, so they provided a, the funding to Shedco. So it was like a, it was completely like a, you know, complete fund, like just, they gave the money to Shedco, 20000 And so, 
but they're, they're managing it for us. And so what happens is that Shedco get, is, gave the loan to the business owner for 20000 So the business owner has this loan, and it's you know, very low interest rate. And so it's over, you know, over a period of time. And so as the business owner pays back the loan to Shedco, they are, you know, Shedco's the one that has money. So now Shedco is getting this money back as, as with the low rate interest as well. But since it's in a CD, the CD also has a, a top interest rate on top. So it's almost like double interest. And so, you know, there's the, all the, the interest is going in. And at the end, once the CD is released, in that case, then Shedco has the ability to use those funds now to most likely what we're going to do is put it back into the seat, keep it in there, and so we can do it again is probably what we're going to do. But, you know, in, in really in a sense we can do that with anything. We're also thinking possibly using it to, like, match another grant or, you know, doing something else. But most likely we want to keep it within, you know, business development. And so, yeah. Does that answer your question or do you want? No, so yeah, so the, the rate, the interest from the CD is going back to Shedco, but the interest that the, the business owner pays, I think it's going back to WANA. My name is Bob Burns. I have a question. So far this morning what I've been hearing is, has to do with people in our communities who are possibly interested in getting into business one way or another. My question has to do with the, the importance or the advisability of getting the community, the ordinary persons who aren't interested in doing business, getting them to on board with some of these projects that are going on in our downtowns. Is it important uh, for people like yourselves who have done this to have your communities on board as fully as possible? And if so, what have you done to do uh, precisely that? You want to start? No, I can start. Well, for Woodburn, we have actually engaged uh, the community feedback because our community residents are the ones who are there every day coming into our downtown, participating in the um, restaurants and the shopping and the the events and activities taking place. So we obviously want their feedback. We've presented our concept at different civic groups. We've um, we. Uh, have the videos of our city council meetings. It's all videotaped. So we presented it at the city council meetings. We've had urban renewal meetings. And we've made uh, folks aware that this is happening in our downtown and asked for their feedback. So we're not just, as a city, we don't do our projects blindly. We actually bring our communities on board to ensure that we're addressing their concerns and needs. And we've gotten a 100% um, feedback, on, positive feedback on our project. And I actually have a, one of our city councilors sitting right at this table here and I think uh, Councillor Carney can attest to the fact that, that we have been very involved in the civic engagement as well. And if I were to add to that, um, I think that when we were talking about when you're doing like a pop-up or any of these types of investments to your community, what your community needs are and making sure that you're answering those questions versus, oh, this sounds like a good idea, let's have a boutique pop-up when no one's interested. So if, uh, like I was saying with the equestrian group, if that tends to be your niche, well then fill that need. Think of what that need is before you move forward. I think that the, you know, the, the alleyway, they were, you know, appealing to a need. The shark tank, you know, we, need, we have businesses that need guidance, they're appealing to the need. And that's when you get community buy-in, is when you listen first. Um, no one wants to be spoken to, they want to be listened to. Um, I also think that when you're doing, um, if you were to do something like a pop-up, we made sure to reach out to local vendors. We didn't just go to where the biggest and the best was. What does our community provide? Because then their friends and their neighbors, another part of the community, are going to be your patrons. And then back to the point of trying to get nonprofits involved, what are your community's nonprofits, right? Give back to your community and, and that group. Um, 
also too, uh, like PTAs, you know, every, every community has got a, a, you know, the, we all have different stages of life, and PTAs tend to be really active. So with our pop-up, we did do a progressive crawl, crawl to entice people to not just shop the pop-up, but shop our other stores too, right? And so as they went through the neighborhood and got little stamps that they had purchased, X amount of dollars, they were put into a raffle for a drawing. So then you get that excitement and that check back. So there's lots of different, again, these, these small manageable steps that, you know, you hope, you know hopefully you, you instill in your programs, those small little steps are also small little contacts. And the more that you do that kind of a drip campaign throughout whatever event it is that you're, that you're up to, I think that the better response you're going to get. And then when people see that response, the easier it is for the next and the next. And the one thing I, I hadn't mentioned, public speaking is like trying to sing karaoke when you're tone deaf in my world. but. Um, is, is the, the, is the follow-up and the follow-through. And if you know that your community, your city, your nonprofit has an upcoming event that you want to promote, always promote your next event at your current event because then you get that follow-through and, and that buy-up and also to that feeling of the community. This isn't a one-stop shop. We're always here. Okay, do we have time for one or two? Okay. My name is Scott Sterling. I'm with the Hub Planning Commission. Uh, how does someone, if they want to be one of these pop-ups or one of these uh, businesses inside of the business, how do they go about trying to get that done? Also, I'm, I'm the president of my uh, Lions Club, and what can a Lions Club do or something like this? So uh, those are really great questions, and I think that where the conversation begins is with the owner of that property. Um, you know, if you've got a, a person who's interested that has come to you and said, hey, I really want to do a pop-up to feel out what it's going to be like to move to your town, who should I contact? The first thing that I would do is look at what are my available for lease commercial properties right now, and then I would contact each one of those people. Then you have to ask yourself what time do you have for that involvement. I think that the more that you can, like, concierge that conversation, the more successful you'll be at making that happen. I think that if you have a disinterested property owner, then go to the next one. Because if the next one says yes, and the one that said no sees the success of the one that says yes, they may be more prone to say yes to you the next time that you ask. And as far as to what uh, your Lions Club could be involved with, sometimes Lions Clubs actually have their own centers why not be a host of one of the first pop-ups? The, the, the leasing of the building isn't the only aspect or the only appeal of a pop-up, it's also to foster new businesses. So you might, if you have that available to you, be the first to take that option. And then it would also give you something to refer the other businesses to. This is what we did, this is what the return is, we have the opportunity to share that with you as well. Does that answer your question? There's a couple different things that I might try, <laughs> and I and I and I do love the challenge. Um, I think that too when we first, th so the person that, that that I dealt with was had never done this before, actually hadn't really leased out space, and so I try to think of what is that person's motivation again? What can I offer to them? What value can I provide to them first, rather than just ask for the favor? So what I realized is that she needs to lease this space. How can I help her do that? We, whether it has a pop-up shop or not, whether she has somebody for a weekend or not, didn't really, it wasn't meaningful to her. But I noticed that she really didn't have a good presence in trying to lease that space out. So I offered to put up a flyer, to do photographs, to give all of the information, and to really promote the leasing of her building. And for us, and, and, and then too, if it's a shorter term thing, if you find that there's some hesitation, make it really manageable. Have it be for a couple of days. Uh, you know, if you're going to do any kind of fundraising, ask her, hey, for, for, or he, she, them, you know, $500 for two days. You know, our organization covers the insurance. You don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, you know, we'll promote your business and really try to get you a, a person, you know, a person in that place. That's our goal for you. And so, and then all we ask in return is, is the space for two days. And if it works out for you and it's something that you'd like to do in the future, that's a conversation we want to have. But again, always add that 
value. It's just kind of like when we were talking about the community, always listen to your community first and figure out how you can fill their need. And so it's the same thing with property owners. How can I fill their need? And to his point, you know, if you've got a lot of people that are up and some are telling you no, then go to the person who says yes. It might not be the place that you have envisioned, but it gives you an example to say, this is what we did for them. How can we do this for you? And then you have a track record of success that you can sell to them. Okay, we're going to take one more question. Actually, that was uh, kind of the answer to my question, but I will, I will uh, <laughs> expand on it a little bit. I'm Priscilla Bywell, a city councilor from Staten, part of our Friends of Old Town Staten, and a business owner. Um, and I actually had a question for Jamie, and it was very similar to the one that uh, Noel just answered. I am amazed that of the um, owners, the business owners or the property owners in the alleys, you did not have anyone that lived in Timbuktu that could care less about what you were doing and uh, and had not only had no interest in it, but didn't return your phone calls, uh, no way to get a hold of the property owner, just no interest at it at, in it at all. Or did you have some that were a little harder to engage and how did you engage them? You're absolutely right, and I work with many communities where that's been a tremendous issue. Fortunately, in Woodburn, the, we have a small number of out-of-town property owners, but since um, we do have our building improvements revolving loan program, and we've had a lot of roof damage due, the, due to this very difficult winter we've had, they've been calling me quite a bit lately, and while I've got them on the phone, it's a, by the way, we're doing this project and. But it's such, the alleyway, um, in, in downtown is such a concern for the property owners that they really are engaged. Most of our businesses adjacent to this first alley are actually operating those businesses. Um, there's a couple leased spaces, but again, they're very active and engaged in the process. Um, the city f just happens to own one of the buildings along there, so needless to say, we're a little engaged. Um, but it's really just a good communication. And again, one of the first things I did, being not being from the Woodburn area and getting to know our businesses, is I literally went door to door and met our businesses down there, talked with them, shared their um, input, shared what we were hoping to do as a city, and listened to them with the concerns of, you know, city um, economic development past, and really. Made, you know, made sure that we connected on that and, and assured them that we are going to do things. So uh, I'm sure at some point we will meet resistance because we do have a couple of property owners downtown that are not as willing to work with us as others might be. But fortunately for this particular um, project, the needs of the community overweighed one or two property owners who just didn't want to put anything into it. And when we start with, this won't cost you anything other than your commitment then it, it starts out really good that way. Okay, and as uh, referenced earlier, we're going to make the slides available for what you saw today. And we'll 